Good morning. How's everyone doing today? We've had some really great weather. Who's ready for fall? Yes. Yes, I love fall. Summer is my top, but fall is a close second. So I'm excited about this cooler weather. Just a couple announcements for you. If you are visiting with us today, please fill out a guest card um, in the front of the pew. Turn it in um, with the offering basket that goes around later, or see me at the welcome desk after church. Um, we had our faith day yesterday down at the farm, farm grounds. If you missed it, it was lots of fun. We had a phone party. The kids were messy, wet, bubbly, muddy, <laughs> but they had a good time, obviously. Um, today, tonight is our Vesper service. Um, Pastor Josh will be um, giving the message to the community. And then all the other area churches are involved as well. So come out to that same spot down there at the farm grounds. Um, our parade is coming up. If you still want to help with the float, see Angie here. Blessing of the backpacks. This is for our students and anybody who is a teacher. Um, doesn't have to be in Williamsburg, but a teacher anywhere. We want to bless you guys before you start your school year. Um, so that's next Sunday. So we'll know you'll already be a weekend, but we still want to bless you. We want to pray over you guys. So kids, bring your backpacks next Sunday. Um, we're going to pray over you guys. And then that is the start of our September family fun. So if you look in your bulletin, you'll see all the fun activities we have planned for the month of September. All right. Stand. And let's get ready to start this morning right.
some of us who are a little older, maybe, and some of uh, some of you who are have been well versed by uh, older people in your family. Um, one of my favorite songs is "There's Something About That Name." It is a powerful, powerful chorus to sing. But I always found the most powerful part, not actually the song itself, but the recitation that Gloria Gaither wrote for it. And I love this part in particular. And she's talking about the name of Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet it still stands. And that is as true today as it was back during the time of Jesus. They're always trying to tear it down, right? But here's one thing I know. Listen, if you ever are experiencing fear or anxiety, just open the Bible. There's 365 verses that are going to pop out at you and get you there. But you know what? <laughs> There's even more verses about the power of Jesus and what he has. I love Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There are no qualifiers. There are no lists of who can and who cannot. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how powerful his name is. And in Jeremiah 10, 6, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. If you would worship with us. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance. After the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms. Will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Amen. Amen. Worship with us, please. Look, look, look at the beginning. One with God.
knee should bow of those in heaven and those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Good morning. My scripture that I want to share today is about forgiveness. Uh, it's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Verse 31 covers what Pastor Josh has been preaching the last few weeks. Uh, without forgiveness, there's no getting past these feelings. Be tender hearted, be kind, forgive one another, for God has forgiven us through Jesus. I think sometimes it's easier to accept forgiveness for our sins from the Lord than it is to forgive ourselves or to forgive others that have hurt us. Our, God's grace is given to us freely. His forgiveness is given to us freely. We need to share that with others, that same type of grace, that same type of forgiveness. None of us are perfect. Uh, the internet, social media, TV may lead you to believe that you have to be perfect. And they'll show you their version of perfection. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all made mistakes. To truly accept God's grace and forgiveness, we must show the same to others and forgive ourselves as well. Could I have the ushers, please? As you praise the Lord today and every day, don't let being chained to unforgiveness keep you from an amazing relationship with the Lord. Forgive yourself, forgive others, and draw closer to Him. Lord, I thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship your name and praise, to worship you in giving and tithes and offering. Lord, I pray the Lord that... Uh, 
We let nothing stand between our relationship with you, uh, whether it be unforgiveness or bitterness or anger. Lord, uh, let us forgive others that may have hurt us. Let us forgive ourselves because you freely forgave us, Lord. Uh, as Holly shared, there's no list of specialties that has to be for you to accept us. You accept us all when we ask for forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you bless your people today, bless your church. Lord, we just ask that we bless you all you throughout this whole week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How's everybody doing today? Somebody's not happy. So I heard a story about a preacher that got up on Sunday morning um, and he apologized because he had a Band-Aid on his face. And so he apologized to the congregation and he said, I was thinking about my sermon while shaving this morning and I cut myself. After the sermon, after church was over, the church treasurer took out an envelope in the offering plate, and, the, and it had a note on it, and it said, next time, think about your face and cut the sermon. So hopefully I won't keep you guys too long today, but uh, I want to say it's good to have you. If you are a visitor with us, welcome. Uh, we are so excited that you're with us. Um, if you're not, welcome back. I uh, hope you had a good week. It's been good. A couple days we've had some very dear friends of ours, uh, Jason and Pam Wilson. So you'll see them afterwards. Make sure you introduce yourselves. Uh, he is a Georgia fan, so you guys are kind of used to that from what I've heard. So don't beat up on him too much, okay? So, we are in a series, no offense, okay? And I hope you guys have enjoyed this series about taking offense when, as believers in Christ, that's what we're not supposed to do, okay? Hopefully, hopefully you've gotten the gist of that and kind of thought about uh, this series this week and uh, the past couple weeks. Well, today, Kelly kind of hit on what we're talking about, forgiveness, forgiveness. And that's hard to do, isn't it? You know, first, I want to share with you one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible talking about forgiveness. I don't, I don't even know if you're allowed to have favorite scriptures, but I do. Um, so, it's Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and it starts in verse 13. And it says this. Actually, I'm going to do NIV, Steve. So, if you want to pull up the NIV translation, that would be awesome. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13, says this. Hopefully, uh, never mind, I'll just read it, and uh, there we go. Uh, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We could stop right there, couldn't we? For just a moment, we could stop right there. We could say, thank you, God, and be encouraged for the rest of our lives because of what Jesus Christ did for us. He rescued you. He rescued me. It doesn't say he will rescue you. It says he did rescue you. Not later on, he has rescued us. It's a done deal on a cross that he did so many years ago for me and for you. What's fascinating about that word rescued, in the Greek word, in the Greek translation, that word, I'm going to try to say this, it's eriusado, eriusado, which is hard, I'm not going to make you say it, but it literally means to snatch oneself, to grab somebody, that's literally what it means, and so I started thinking about that word, to rescue, to rescue, to snatch oneself. So my boys like to, uh, I was going to say drive, yeah, I hope they're not driving yet, yeah, that, that's a problem, right? But they like to ride their bikes in the street, okay? And I was thinking about this, we've had a couple close calls with some of the younger ones trying to teach them, hey, stay out of the road, you know, don't get too crazy, but I thought about that word, irisado, irisado, 
to snatch oneself. And basically, I want to give you the image. It's like one of your kids running out into the street and there's a car coming. And the parent, the mother, or the father is going to see the thing that's about to happen in their kid. What do they do? They run out and they snatch the kid out of harm's way, don't they? Hopefully. Or they push the child out of harm's way. Guys, that's what God did for you. And that's what God has done for me. He saw the harm that was coming to us and he snatched us out to himself through Jesus Christ. That's what he's done for us. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. It goes on and it says this. It says this in Colossians. He has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Friends, we are not just saved from something. You are saved to something. And so this series, this message tonight or today, I hope is going to just resonate with some of you guys talking about forgiveness. Last week, we talked about bitterness and how it's not good to be bitter all the time. We've talked about complaining. We've talked about, I don't even know what else, you know, in this series. And I probably offended some of you guys, but it's, it's, it's to just really get you to understand what you are rescued from. And two, you are not just being snatched out of the kingdom of darkness and then placed in some kind of spiritual no man's land. That's not what God has done for you if you are a believer in Christ. If you are a believer, and I understand not everybody in here might be a believer, and that's okay. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for being here, investigating this guy called Jesus. But if you are a believer, you have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness as you have been saved into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. He saved you some, from something into something. He has done that. That's incredible when we really think about it. It's incredible to understand what God has done for me and what God has done for you. In fact, if you are a believer, here's what, here's what the Bible says. It's all about fitting in now into the kingdom of God integration. You know, when you move from one nation to another, it's all about how do you fit in? How do you become part of that culture? You need to learn the new culture of the new nation as a believer in Christ. How are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? And friends, we have the perfect example through the word of God, through Jesus Christ himself. He, if, if we only model him, that's all we need. But here's what we need to do, too. We need to learn the value system of the new nation. You need to speak the language of the new believer. You need to become ambassadors of this kingdom. Uh, what's interesting is it goes on to say this. It's about this son whose kingdom this is. In whom redemption, we have the redemption. In whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To me, it's interesting that Paul speaks about Christ in this kingdom and that you're now saved into and I'm saved into. And one of the first things that he tells us, it's the redemption or the kingdom is about the forgiveness of sins. If there's anything that you need to understand first about the kingdom of God, you need to understand forgiveness. And this is where it gets tricky for me. And I'm sure for some of you, we have a hard time with forgiveness. You see, we have to understand the vertical part of forgiveness from God to us. Forgiveness. He's forgiven you. If you've called upon his name, he has forgiven you. You don't have to worry about who you were once. You don't have to worry about that, the past. He has forgiven you. That's the, for, the vertical part of forgiveness. It's him forgiving us from our sins. But here's what you also need to understand. If God has forgiven you, there's a horizontal part of forgiveness. And what does that symbolize? The cross. It's all been done on the cross. Vertical, horizontal for you and for me. So we need to understand forgiveness and forgiveness for those who have trespassed against us. Because at one point, all of us have trespassed against God. Amen. At one point, you were messed up. You might still be messed up. In fact, you know, I like to say we're all more messed up than we think we are, aren't we? But here's the thing. You are more love than you can ever imagine. You are. I'm more love than I can ever imagine. 
But if you have to understand anything about the kingdom of God, it's that word of forgiveness. Because that vertical and the horizontal part paints, paints the picture of the cross. The full redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And when the disciples, his best friends, when he was on this earth, asked Jesus how to pray, he told them to pray about what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness of our sins. You know, the vertical part, like, like we forgive those who have trespassed against us as well. Vertical and horizontal, they connect, but they have to go hand in hand. Because you have been forgiven of something. So we have to share that with others. In order for us to understand that, we have to release forgiveness to somebody else too. And here's where it gets part. Here's where it gets tricky. Here's where I'm probably going to step on some toes and that's okay. But before I do, uh, last week I showed a video about uh, a parable, which a parable, if you don't know, is a short story that Jesus used to talk about when he was here. A short story that people would just be engaged. You see, sinners were engaged with Jesus. They were nothing like Jesus, but they were drawn to him. And he would share these stories with them. But I want to read to you the story from Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, or if you have your phone and you want to turn there, it's basically a question that Peter, one of the disciples, is asking Jesus, okay? Peter, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, says this, and he says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Well, that's a question, you know, that's, we probably have all asked. How many times do I have to forgive you? How many times are you going to mess with me? Or are you going to mess with my family and do I have to forgive you? And, and Peter goes on to say, as many as seven times. I mean, that's probably pretty, that's, that's a lot, honestly. Because let's be truthful, you mess with me once, what do I normally want to do? I want to write you off, right? Okay, everybody's looking at me like, well, you're the only one. No, I'm not. You guys know it. Somebody messes with you or somebody messes with your family, guess what? You have your guard up, don't you? Well, what's fascinating, let's see what Jesus says. Well, actually, let me back up. Peter's asking this question because he says to Jesus, he goes, how many times do I have to forgive in order to be one of your disciples? How many times do I have to forgive somebody who's hurt me or who's sinned against me? And as part of Jesus' answer to this question that honestly you guys would ask probably, I would ask, what's interesting he shares a parable with Peter and the disciples in a short story. And he talks about this. He says, the kingdom of heaven being like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, that's important. Now, here we go. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children in all that he had that a payment make to be, was supposed to be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And then the master of the servant was moved with compassion and released and forgave his debts. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and he said, This is serious. Pay me what you owe me. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you all, everything I have. But he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, we may read that or you may listen to that story and we get the basics, right? We understand that there's a king. And we understand, you probably have put two and two together, that king is who? It's God, right? It's God. The king represents God and the servant could be you, it could be me. And we've been forgiven of a lot. And that as we are hesitant and unwilling to forgive our fellow men, that's basically what this story is. 
We're hesitant and we're worried, and that kind of makes sense to us, right? But the thing is, there's such a great part of this story that you might have never caught before, and I didn't either until a few years ago when I did this series. I never caught this. And I'm going to share it with you, and, and I hope that you catch it and you understand how huge this is for me and you. It's, it's the point of the story isn't just about the forgiveness, okay? The point of the story, there's a great part of the punchline that Jesus is trying to relate to us. And that he's trying to relate to the disciples. And here's what, where it's at. It's found in the currencies, the money that Jesus talks about. The money. How many of you like counting or money in, in, or like any sort of numbers? I do not. Okay? I do not. But it wasn't until I understood and somebody shared this with me that I was like, wow. And it just blew my mind. So I'm going to just try to explain this to you in the best way I can. And hopefully I don't confuse you. Now, Jason, who's with us uh, today, when I did this at our previous church, he actually helped me out because he's a numbers guy. He's smarter than I am, okay? Remember I asked you in the beginning of the series, who is smarter than the average bear, basically? Jason is smarter than everybody else here. Sorry. I know. It's, it's crazy. But, so here, let's, let's go with this. The meaning of that talents and an air high. So, of course, we hear that thousands of years later, later, and we talk about talents and denarii. What is that? We don't talk about that now, do we? We talk about cash. Give me cash, Bitcoin, crypto, whatever you have, you know, stocks, bonds, all this kind of stuff. We don't normally deal with talents or denarii, do we, on a daily basis? But so it's important that you understand this because if you don't, we risk losing the perspective that Jesus is trying to relay across to us. So I'm going to try to explain this and I hope that I pray that it's going to open your eyes to forgiveness and give you a whole new meaning of forgiveness. Okay, so let's make this very clear invisible. We have two relationships in this parable, in the story that Jesus is talking about. We have the one with his king and the servant, and there's a debt involved of 10,000 talents, which if, if I said to you, this guy owned 10,000 talents, that would probably mean nothing to anybody, right? Probably, well, I don't know what a talent is. Is that $10,000? No, I'm glad you asked. It's not, but it means nothing to us. Hopefully it's about to change. And we have another relationship with that same servant and another guy. That this other guy owes him a debt of a hundred denarii. Now, how could we translate this value of money into something that you would be able to understand? How can I do that? And, and when you look at the Bible and when you see numbers, the Bible translators, as they're working to, you know, put the word of God together and give it to us, they'll always try to avoid to include certain numbers. Because if they will write so and so many dollars for us, if they're going to write, you know, $10,000 for us, there would be like 10 or 20 years difference from the time they wrote it. So what happens? It's called inflation, right? So I heard it's somebody's birthday today, uh, Rich Brantner's birthday's today. So I decided to do a little bit of uh, investigating it. When Rich was born in the 20s, I found... I found some, uh, some pretty interesting inflation. So in the 1920s, I'm just kidding, he wasn't born in the 20s. If he, does, if he was, he looks pretty good. In the 1920s, if you wanted to buy a house, okay, if you were looking for the, you know, the beautiful house, the white picket fence, uh, a new house would have cost approximately $6,296. Sign me up right? That's a little bit of a jump from today's houses, right? What about a, an apartment in New York City, the Big Apple? In the 20s, in New York City, an apartment costs $60 a month. Wow, yeah, okay. How about groceries? A dozen eggs in the 20s cost 47 cents. 
47 cents. That's pretty interesting, right? All right, let's find something else. A manicure, ladies. For all you ladies out there that love your manicures, it costs less than 25 cents for a manicure. I wouldn't know because I don't get my stuff done. What about the most trendy hairstyle, ladies, of the 20s? It was the bob, you know, bob and weave, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> to get that cut was $5. $5 back then. Ladies, are you paying $5 for your haircut right now and your colors and stuff? No? Well, maybe some money is. I don't know. Maybe it's free. I know some of you, our friends are in, in the middle of uh, pl planning a wedding for their daughter. In the 30s, um, I'm sorry, in the 20s, uh, it was, the cost was roughly $400 to plan a wedding, $400. As our friends Jason and Pam will tell you, you know, it's a lot more expensive than $400 today. How about a new radio? At the beginning of the 20s, a new radio cost over $200, which that was pretty pricey for back then, you know, but, you know, today it's a lot more. Or what about a movie ticket? A movie ticket um, cost about 15 cents in the 20s. Isn't that crazy? But my point in telling you all that, and I could go on and on and on, obviously, but my point in telling you all that is there was inflation. So that's why when we read about numbers in God's word, there's not inflation. And I know, stay with me here, because this is going to get real, real important in the next few minutes. So there's a way that we can understand why Jesus is telling us about the currency, and why they put it in God's word. Even though we're on this side of the world and it's thousands of years later, there's one thing that wouldn't change for them that is still kind of today's that we can compare, and it's by using a day's wage. Okay, by using a day's wage here. So you all know like how much you made in one day, typically. Because one day's wage, the average amount of money that you would earn in a day would be about the same for, for back then and even for now. Even though the sum would be different, the value, that's what we're talking about, the value of this would be practically the same. It would be pretty much the amount of money needed for you to pay off your mortgage a little bit. It would be enough for you to get some food on the table, buy some nice clothes or whatever, get a bob, haircut, whatever, whatever you needed for a decent life. It will be included in one day's wage. Now, in Jesus' time, his day's wage would have been one denarius, one denarius, which was a silver coin back then. So a denarius equals one day's wage. I know this, I don't like math either, but you got to stay with me because this is going to blow your mind. So what about the talents? What about the talents that Jesus talks about? So a denarius is one day's wage. One talent. All right, so we're already doing math. One talent equaled 6,000 denarii. 6,000. That's 6,000 days of work, okay? 6,000 days of work for, for this, this servant, so that would be, you know, the equivalent of what? What in our modern day? I know none of you have an idea, so I'm going to give it to you. The equivalent of one or 6,000 days of work in 2021, the average daily wage was $154.64 in 2021. Average, okay? I know there's, you know, it fluctuates at certain times, but for obviously different jobs. You know, there's some people earning more than that, some people earning less than that, but that was the national day's wage in 2021. So that would be a modern day equivalent of that. The denarius would be 154.64. So one talent is 6,000 denarii. One denarii would be 154.64, which would mean one talent is $927,840. That is one talent, my friend. One talent. Stick with me here. How many talents did the, the guy owe the king? 10,000. 
10,000 talents he owed the king. Okay, you know how much that is? Nine billion, 278 million, and 400,000 dollars. First of all, let's, let's talk about this dude, okay? Why would the king continue to give the guy money if he owed him $2 billion? That, you know, what's he doing with that? And back in that time, you know, I mean, what is he doing with all of that money? What happened here? You know, and, and how did he say a servant to this guy, right? Because I'm not, I don't know, uh, that's just my, you know, ADHD coming in here. It's a crazy amount of money, isn't it? Two billion dollars is what Jesus is basically talking about. That this guy owes the king. Two billion dollars. You know, and why is Jesus giving these guys this universal like space, you know, hey, Monopoly money, here you go, you know, or Oprah, there's a car for you, here's a car for you, whatever it is. Why is Jesus telling him this? That's, I'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about it. He wants to tell his disciples, get this, that we all have a debt before God that you will never be able to pay back. You're never going to be able to pay that back. Even though that guy, which is really pathetic in the story that Jesus says, he says to the king, just give me a little bit of time. Okay, dude, really? You're going to get $2 billion in a little bit of time? No. We know that's not happening, right? He's telling the king, I'll figure it out. I'll find a way. No, come on, man. You are not. You are not. That's a gambling anonymous class that you need to go to for the rest of your life. But anyways, he's not going to be able to pay a billion dollar debt back. In church, you are in the same position. And I am in the same position. No good work that you ever do. No religious deed that you do, even if it's good, could pay back the debt that you and I owe for our sins. None of that. That's why we need a Savior in Jesus Christ. And that's why God loved you so much that he sent his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not what perish, but have everlasting life. So I want you to remember that. Nine billion dollars, okay? Nine billion. Now let's go over here. What is the debt then? A hundred denarii. So we've already gone over the basic math, so I'm not going to bore you again. But 100 denarii times 154, the day's wage, would make it $15,000, $464, okay? Now, why is Jesus choosing that amount in this story, in this parable? You think he's got a point? Because that's pretty specific. $15,000. You see, $15,000 is pretty significant debt, isn't it? I mean, $15,000 is a lot of money, amen? Can I get an amen here? That's a lot of money for me. I don't know, maybe some of you guys are millionaires, but that's a lot of money. So, I mean, if somebody owed you $15,000 and one day said, sorry, I can't pay it back, oh, huh, you gonna feel all rosy inside? Probably not, right? To most of us, that's going to be a real problem. Most of us aren't in a position where we can let go of $15,000. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that this guy really owed a lot of money. And maybe that's your situation. Maybe somebody owed you a lot of money. Maybe somebody did you wrong and it hurts. Maybe you got your heart broken at one point in your life. Maybe somebody treated you bad in, in church. There's no excuse for that. There isn't. Maybe there's a considerable debt involved between you and someone else. And as long as you stay focused on the perspective of that debt only, those $15,000, it will look like a big amount. And technically, you're right, it is. But here's the point. $15,000 is only a lot of money until you compare it to $9 billion, church. $9 billion. And see, that is the perspective and the point of forgiveness. 
forgiveness. Jesus is not saying that this amount of $15,000 over here is small and insignificant and can be easily forgotten. But what he asks of us is to simply take a few steps back and compare it with the debt that you have that he has canceled in your life. That's what he's asking us to look at. And the more we look at this, the more eager we'll let go of the $15,000 that somebody owes us. Uh oh, it's quiet. However, if we fix our eyes on that and that alone, we can say, I have the right. I have that righteous anger. Remember, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Maybe you're due, but you're taking your eyes off the $9 billion that you owe God. And you're putting $15,000 in a different perspective, right? You're taking your eyes off that. Now, if I was the devil, and I'm happy that I'm not, but if I was, I would work overtime to try to have you not see this point, okay? To try to steer your thoughts and your minds away from this, to just focus your eyes on that debt of $15,000 that somebody else owes you. That's what I would try to have you thinking about all the time, or something that somebody did bad to you in your life, in your marriage, in your homes, in your workplaces. I would just try to do whatever I could to bring your eyes away from the fact that God has forgiven you and I of so much more than that. So much more than the $15,000. That's what I'm going to try to do for you. And the main reason and the main way he does that is through our pride. Our pride. We talked about pride and being humble a couple weeks ago. You see, pride kills forgiveness. It does. Because you know what? We are not forgiven automatically just because we are children of God. We are forgiven because of the sins that we confess to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why we're forgiven. We come approaching the throne humble, with, and he gives us grace. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, pride will have you think that, nah, there's no $9 billion. There's no $9 billion. I ain't that bad, okay? I might have stolen a candy bar at one point when I was five years old, but there ain't no $9 billion debt that I owe to God. I'm doing quite well. And all of a sudden, what, what are you doing? You are playing down the fact that God had to send his only son to die for you and the sins in mine. My sin. Amen? And this is the very reason that God hates pride. God hates pride. Repeatedly in the Bible it says that God hates pride along with other sins. Why? Because church pride will rob you of a blessing. It will rob you of a blessing. Pride will block your heart so that you don't see your own need of forgiveness. And because we don't, we will not be very eager to forgive others, will we? To forgive them of the $15,000 that somebody else owes us. You see, that's why it's important. I have to continue to talk about sin as a pastor. I don't like to. I wish I... I we talked about it last night, actually. I wish I could be, and I don't want to call on names, but one of these pastors that, oh, the rosy, the rosy life that you're going to live is beautiful if you just give to the church and you do that. No. See, the Bible talks about life is hard, life is difficult, and we need somebody else, and that's Jesus Christ to help us through the tough times. Amen? But see, sin is only a problem if there's no forgiveness. If there's forgiveness, and it is. Realizing that you are in daily need of the grace of God and the forgiveness of God is the door opener to a brand new world of freedom. And you know, as we realize how much God has actually done for us, and as I'm constantly reminding myself of the $9 billion that God erased from my debt account, you know what happens? I become a different person. 
My mentality changes towards other people. My perspective, more than anything. And you see, there's a peace that comes, and that peace is found in forgiveness. Forgiveness. I've had to work at it in my own life. I'm just being truthful and honest. That's probably the hardest thing that I've had to do, and I'm still working on that daily. But I've seen it in my life, and I've seen it in the others, in the lives of others. And I want to, I want to share a story with you. You know, I like stories. I read this uh, a couple years ago in Christianity Today. It's a magazine that it's pretty good, but it's about a young person. Uh, I think in Sweden, uh, and God transformed her life, and it's intentional. And this is about a girl named Sarah, okay? Now, Sarah, many years ago, was 16 years old, and she was raised in a completely secularized environment, okay? No, no influence of Christianity, no influence of God or church or anything, in fact, Sarah's parents were atheists. And they, so she was raised without any concept of, of religion or the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as Sarah attended high school, she came in uh, contact with quite a few young people that attended a large Christian church. And these people went to the church, these kids, and they shared the gospel of Jesus with Sarah. She thought they were weird and they were crazy and there are some very weird Christians and don't raise your hand if you know some of them because it might be you. But she thought they were crazy. But then the Holy Spirit started doing something in Sarah's life. And as they talked more about this guy, Jesus, she became curious and she wanted to investigate and she became really interested and for weeks and weeks and weeks, she asked all of her questions to them about God and eternity and purpose and forgiveness. And eventually, Sarah gave her life to the Lord. And as Sarah became a Christian, she became a Christian that was on fire for God. She would witness to all of her friends. She would witness to her family. She would share Jesus with them. She became known all over her school. You see, the girl who used to be an atheist started to run a Bible study. It started to run, you know, Christian concerts and bring in people in her school. And in, in major different events that were promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ, Sarah was in charge with. And here's what happened. A major revival broke out in Sarah's school, a non-Christian school in Scotland. A major revival broke out. And she's just a few short months of being a believer. And she's not been a believer for very long. And she's still going crazy for Jesus Christ. But then all of a sudden, Sarah heard some different news in her life. She had just been diagnosed with a serious form of cancer at 16 years old. And this diagnosis happened way too late, according to the doctors. And it spread all over this young teenager's body, and she had minimal chances of survival. Minimal. In hearing this, the church that Sarah went to, the pastor calls her one day. And he gets, he gets her number. And this is a pretty big church, pretty large church. And as he dialed her number, the story that he said in the magazine, he said, this was actually the first time that I talked to this girl, Sarah. First time. And he said, there was many things that were running through my mind as I'm talking to this girl or I'm ready to talk to her. How is this 16-year-old girl coping with this? That she's about to die soon. How is she coping with it? She's brand new in the Lord. What's left of her faith? She can't have that much faith, right? She's a new believer. What's left of her passion? What's left of her fire? So he hears Sarah pick up the phone on the other end. And she says, hello? And he says, hey, Sarah, this is pastor. This is pastor calling. And she goes on, oh, pastor, it's awesome to hear from you. Praise God. 
I can't wait to tell you what God is doing in my school, pastor. I can't wait to tell you what God has changed in somebody's life here and here and here. She kept going on and on and on and on over the phone. And there was praise gods, there was hallelujahs, there was all the kinds of things right there. And the pastor's thinking as she's talking, is she in denial? Like, is she seriously in denial? She just got terrible news that there is a cancer in her that is no longer going to help her with survival here. And she's 16 years old. And he's thinking, you know, she hasn't really caught up with the news. Or maybe she's trying to push reality away and covering up and saying things that she might think that she would like to hear or that I might like to hear as a pastor. But he said in the magazine, after 20 minutes, she finally stopped to breathe. <laughs> she stopped to breathe and, and uh, he says, Sarah, that's, that's awesome. That's amazing. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, but I, I heard some really bad news, Sarah. I, I just realized that you've also heard some really hard news. And Sarah says, oh, you mean the cancer? You mean the cancer? Yeah, I heard about it. And then they had a conversation. And it turns out Sarah knew the seriousness of the situation. She knew the seriousness of the cancer that was in her body. You know, and of course she had her question marks. And the pastor said her and Sarah, or him and Sarah talked. But then she said this to him. Pastor, there's been a few Christian brothers and sisters of mine that have been saying things like God can heal people. And that'd be just great if he would. But here's the way I see it, Pastor. And he said that he'll never forget the words that came out of this 16-year-old girl's mouth. She said, here's the way I see it. I know that my sins are forgiven. I know that. And even if I die from this, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I just have one concern. One concern, Pastor. And that one concern, that one thing that is most important to me, is that it's to bring as many people with me to heaven as possible in the time that I have left in this world. Wow. Is that not powerful or what? To bring as many people with me to heaven as possible. I don't care about the diagnosis. God's got it. I don't care about the negativity. God is in control. Amen? The pastor said in the magazine article, he said tears were just running down his face because he felt overwhelmed with peace but that came out of this 16-year-old girl who just met Jesus Christ a few months prior. You see, that article, the peace wasn't connected to perfect circumstances, was it? Rather the opposite. But the peace was connected to the fact that she knew that the $9 billion dollars had been canceled from her debt account. It's gone. It's done. And whatever happens to her now will not ever change that fact. Whatever the devil will try to throw at her face can never change the fact that she was forgiven. And it's the same for you, and it's the same for me. You see, I know where I'm going when my time on earth is done. I know that God has forgiven me of a $9 billion debt. Now, what's awesome about this story is they did a follow-up article a few years later. Sarah actually survived. You know, she survived. And the pastor said that they couldn't say it was an easy route for her because it was very difficult. It was 10 years of prayer, chemo, radiation, and treatment. But today, Sarah is completely cancer-free. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead. He went on to say in the article that, they, that they're a part of the church that, you know, he pastored at. She married a guy, and they've been missionaries in Thailand for many years. And they adopted a little uh, Thai girl as their daughter. You see, my main point in sharing with you that story is not the fact that Sarah survived only, but the fact that Sarah knew about forgiveness. And that knowledge made her push through, church. It made her push through, though her life might be short or long. That was secondary to Sarah. 
It was. Because she understood the peace that came from forgiveness. Throughout the entire treatment, the article said, she would keep sharing Jesus with the doctors, the nurses, and basically anyone that came across her path. The, the peace that comes from forgiveness, church, the peace that comes from forgiveness is the peace that God wants to give wherever you are, whether you're here with us or you're going to watch online later. God wants to give you peace. But you see, we have to extend the forgiveness part to others. Because accepting the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price for you and whatever you've done, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a $9 billion debt. I can't stress that enough. He's ready to cleanse you from all of your sins. He's ready to erase all the doubts, all the debts from your account. But before we close, and if we want to uh, get ready to do our last song, before we close, I want to share one more story with you. And this is powerful. The other one was powerful too, but this one. <sighs> there is power that is unleashed through forgiveness, church. Power unleashed through forgiveness. Because you know what? When you forgive somebody, you have no idea what you put into motion. When you forgive someone, when you let someone go, even though they've hurt you or somebody you've loved, you have no idea what kind of motion that puts in, in, into perspective, what kind of consequences will come out of that. The same article, the <laughs> magazine, I should say, shared a, a story about 2015. 2015 in February, there was a group of ISIS warriors. ISIS, if you know, that was the terrorist group. 2015, these ISIS individuals led 21 young Egyptian Christians down to a beach in Libya, Northern Africa. 21 Christians they led down to this beach. Those Christians were forced to kneel down and the spokesperson of the ISIS group made a statement that these people of the cross, that's the way he referred to these young Christians, that they were not worthy to be living. They're not worthy, not worthy to be living. And all of the 21 young Christian men were executed on that beach that day. 21. And we talk about we have it hard here, right? We're being persecuted here, right? 21 young men lost their lives because they the power of that man. 21. And you know what they did? ISIS did? They videotaped the whole thing. Videotaped it. Put it on YouTube in an attempt to scare Christians from staying in their faith. In an attempt to motivate them to leave behind the faith in the cross and hide in the darkness of terror. Hide away from the impact of the strong and mighty ISIS forces. However, the article went on to say that it had exactly the opposite effect over it. Because all over Egypt, revival spread like a wildfire. If you don't know about Egypt, it's an, a fairly predominant Islamic nation. And everybody was concerned because these were Egyptian citizens. And so they brought the mother of one of these executed young man, men into a TV studio just weeks after this horrible tragedy happened. They bring her in in the news. And it's the biggest talk of the nation in 2015. And the talk show host asked her, if you had these men that killed your son and his friends, if you had them and you could do anything to them, what would you do? What would punish them more than enough? What would your punishment be for them? And you know what this mom said? She looked into the camera and she said, you know what? I only wish for all of these men to find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. 
I only wish for all of these men who took the lives of my son and the other 20 men that they would know the love of Jesus Christ, that they would find true life and true forgiveness and faith through him. That is my one desire. And church, her words spread over the nation and shocked the entire nation of Egypt because it was clear to them what religion, what faith was strong enough to forgive such a horrendous crime. And it led to a national revival all over Egypt with tens of thousands of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. My point is when you choose to forgive, you have no idea what it can put into motion. No idea. And let's pray right now. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're out there right now. I know some of your guys' stories. You guys know some of my stories. But maybe you're out there and you're struggling with someone that did something to you and you haven't been able to let it go. You haven't been able to forgive that person or people. You see, there was a $15,000 debt that you've been looking at for a long time now that they owe you. And I'm here to tell you today, somebody, it's time to get your eyes on the $9 billion that God has forgiven us from. It's time to stop focusing on the 15000 that's owed to you and start on the debt that we owe God. Right now, I believe that the Holy Spirit is calling your heart to let it go. Let go of the bitterness, let go of the unforgiveness, to be as generous in forgiving others that God has been generous in forgiving you and me. So right now, Would you just allow your minds and allow your hearts to get ready to let the Holy Spirit move in you in that dark area that you've been seeking in and just kind of sitting in and ask him to set you free so you can experience peace that comes from forgiveness. And just like those young men and Sarah, when you do that, unleash the miracles that take place of you forgiving others just like God has forgiven you. Father God, we thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for Jesus first and foremost. God, we thank you for him that he came here to die for us. God, we thank you that our debt, we can't even understand how big our debt was to you, God, but you have wiped it clean. God, we thank you for that debt of the $9 billion that you've just wiped clean from our accounts. And we thank you for forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you forgive us when we're too prideful. That that you forgive us when we haven't acknowledged our need for forgiveness. That you forgive us when we, we just haven't gotten our perspectives correct. We've been less eager to forgive those who have hurt us and, and trespassed against us. But Father, we let go of those trespasses. In Jesus' name, of the people who have hurt us, just like you erased our sins and our debts. Father, I pray right now for anybody in here and online who makes that decision for the peace of God that passes all of our earthly understanding, God. God, I pray that you would move in their hearts and their souls. I pray that many miracles will take place in their families. Many healed relationships will be released through the power of forgiveness. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand in worship. And remember, you have been forgiven of much. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight.
commission is to share your word and your gospel. Lord, I pray that you bless your people. Lord, give us strength to carry on in your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> 